Before we begin, let me go through a little bit of a backstory leading up to this video really quick. Not long ago, JLCMC contacted me and offered them to send me some of their part that they are selling on their website for free in exchange for a shout out in a video. And well, they are a real company selling a lot of stuff that I am actually very interested in. So I accept the offer. The parts arrive just as I finish designing a multi-material centerpiece for my next project for them to go on to. And all that left is for me to print the part out and now, uh, uh, mm, ah, right. This is the only picture I got for it because I genuinely did not think it going, was going to be this difficult. But believe me when I say that was not the only attempt I had made. And after burning through the, an entire kilo of TPU trying to get it to work, I going to have to change the plan in favor of making this video. Nevertheless, I still want to shout out uh, JLCMC here, saying I am genuinely very impressed by what they have sent me and am very appreciated of the details data sheet that they are providing for each and every one of their products. So that's why I'm gonna put their logo right there in the corner of the video. Anyway, that is enough backstory for now. Let's get back to the video. Alright, hi folks, and welcome back to another video. Okay, I have had a working version of Miss Changer for more than a year now, and during which time I have been putting it to fluid paces and did a number of challenging print on it, sometimes unintentionally, and it's, it's about time I summarize my findings and experience with actually using a tool changer so that you guys can uh, don't have to spend the, an entire year to get to where I am. That's not to say, however, uh, that where I am is the end of the road, uh, or that all the information that I'm going about to share is fact. A lot of it might just be my opinion on what I have seen. Nevertheless, it should help for you to get started. The first thing that we need to do uh, for this video is to draw some lines. Uh, for the purpose of this video, I will be showing settings from Prusa Slicer, but nevertheless, I have been informed that some of these uh, settings are making its way to Orca Slicer, and then some. So, if that is your preferred slicer, make sure to update and check for them. Next, I need to draw a line between the definition of multicolor and multi-material. In this video, multicolor is strictly referring to spools of diff of the same material but in different color, while multi-material is referring to spools of different materials regardless of their color. It sounds like I'm just being pedantic, but I am not. Multi-material is genuinely a completely different beast to tackle. And as an example, here is a multicolor ABS print that I did for my sister more than a year ago uh, on a very early version of Messenger that I still managed to do this first go. And well, if you skip the backstory section earlier in the video, this is one of many failed attempts for multi-material printing that I was trying to do last week. The reason why multi-material is so much more difficult can be attributed to three set of parameters. The first one is the compromised print environment then there's the filament management uh, in each tool head. And lastly, there's the, just the general material property of each material in a print. Starting with the print environment, the two specific parameters that are being shared between all filament in a print are the bed temperature and the chamber temperature. For multicolor, well, there's nothing to be considered here. You would just need to set the temperature the same as you would do in a traditional single nozzle print system. For multi-material, however, there will need to be a compromise between the materials. For my specific set of material here, which is from 3D QF, my bed uh, temperature setting had been hovering somewhere between 60 and 80 degrees Celsius, depending on which is the dominant uh, material being print which is hard enough to cause some problem with some PLA print while still being too cold for ABS to reliably stick to the bed. 
Then there's the problem with uh, the chamber. The ABS referred a chamber between 40 and 65 degrees Celsius, while POA will be at risk of premature softening at around 40 degrees Celsius or so, and it can get jammed up in the extruder if that were to happen. To overcome these problems, well, at least to mitigate them, the first thing to do is well to ask yourself whether you actually need to combine this similar material like ABS and POA or not. Most of the time, luckily, the answer is no. You can you and you will have a much much smoother experience if you just swap out the ABS for PDG or ASA to com be combined with uh, POA. Personally, I'm only doing this because I am stubborn, I'm curious, and I'm stalling for that 3D QF uh, ASA line to go online. And if you are in a similar position in one way or another, here are some tips to get it uh, going. First is to use the texture bed. The one that I'm using here is from LDO, and the texture on it is so rough that it's actually acting like sandpaper and destroyed every piece of cloth that I have been using to wipe it. I'm not sure I like that, but for the sake of the print, it worked very well. Then, consider using a bed adhe adhesion assistant agent. Uh, a generic solution like glue stick should work for most of the time, and you can always buy some more specialty stuff uh, later if you need it. Lastly, avoid printing multi materials on the bed if possible. And the best example I have here is with this uh, clip on stand, I have my Steam Deck. Which is uh, which had this cutout for the headphone jack, and in this print, ninety nine percent of the time it's just a normal PETG print, including the support tower. And where the POA come in on this one is literally at that one layer where the interface between the zero gap support and the overhang is. Doing this allow me to avoid compromising on any of my PTG setting because the bed does not need to accommodate for having PLA on it. You can do this too via this setting here in the slicer. Moving on to the chamber heater. Beside the aforementioned uh, premature softening problem of PLA, we will also need to contend with the warping of ABS and well, to some extent even PTG. I have found that, at least for my use case, when you well, when a chamber is staying between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius, my print are more likely to succeed. Well, not all the time. Okay, now that you have sorted out the print environment uh, parameters, it is time to deal with the next set of problems. That is the filament management in each of the two heads. There are three problems that you will need to be looking out for doing this. First is heat creep, then there's oozing, and finally farting. Heat creep is when the heat of the nozzle gets soaked up in the cold side of the hot end, causing the filament to swell and clogged up there. The reason why this is more of a problem for a tool changer, because there will be long periods of time where the filament stays static inside the nozzle, i.e. when it's stop and being in idle. And specifically for multi-material, a warmer chamber for uh, certainly does not help for material like PLA or TPU. Luckily for us though, the solution for this is relatively straightforward. That is to just reduce the nozzle temperature when it is docked. Or just outright turn off the heater. This is done by first selecting this set setting here in the slicer. And yes, I can see that the stated purpose uh, for the setting is saw something else. We'll get to that. Then there's also the uh, temperature variant. And the specific number here is doesn't really matter as long as you set it as a negative number. This is not where you want to set the uh, doctored nozzle temperature. That setting is actually here in each of the filament profile settings. If you don't actually want the nozzle to cool down when it is stopped, then set this temperature to equal to that of the nozzle temp. The reason for doing it this way it can be shown here in the G code that is generated from this settings. The additional temperature command after the two chain command is a quick and easy way to re-enable the heater after a failed two chain if it ever occurred. 
And uh, this is in opposed to trying to figure out a uh, complex pause and resume macro. Turning down the idle temp does not only uh, help with heat creep, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it will also help with another prominent problem with for hydroscopic material, which is oozing. Oozing occurred when the water inside a filament get boiled and turned into steam, which then push more material out of the nozzle than what we would want it, creating these string and blobs. From my experience, I have found that a filament dryer is no longer an optional for materials such as PETG and TPU or a tool changer. You will be dancing with the devil if you decided to use this material in a tool changer without drying them, regardless of whether you're doing this for a multicolor or multi-material. Those blobs that got pushed out of the nozzle will get collected on the white tower and eventually, if it accumulated too much, it will cause the wipe out to fail, which then lead to the whole print failing. To uh, further mitigate the oozing problem, there is also these two settings that you can play with in the extruder setting under printer. Here, you can set the uh, uh, length of material that to retract uh, before docking the tool head. This will give the ooze some room to fill into before it come out of the tip of the nozzle. Then there's this other setting to tell the printer to push out just a little more material at the very start of the wipe tower or so it suggests. Because through my testing I have found that this extra length on restart setting is very useful for to deal with another major problem to watch out for in a tool changer. It's best described with the technical term farting. For material that are very prone to stringing, we need to have a very long uh, retraction upon every tool change as to ensure that there's no string forming on the side of the uh, part pulling itself uh, towards the dock. However, uh, whenever the machine re-extrude that length, it will already leave a blob of material right at the edge of your wipe tower. This happened because air actually got pulled up into the nozzle uh, during that big retraction and get trapped and heat up as the filament being pushed through again. It then behaves not unlike the oozing problem that I spoke of earlier. The only difference is that it will occur to every filament regardless of how dry they are and is proportional to the length of retraction that you uh, impose on the filament. To mitigate it, the first thing you need to do is well retract as little as possible. Then for flexible material, which is what need that long retraction, I will have a negative number for this extra length. And what that meant to do is that meant to spread that uh, inconsistent blob of material across the geometry of the wipe tower instead of having it all collected at one corner of it. Finally, the reason why my print failed over the past week, material properties. For this, you need to pay attention to how the material is expected to behave in a compromised environment and how all material in a print will interact with each other. And the way that these problems are going to reveal themselves is well via the white tower of all things. Starting with an easy example, PETG and POA do not stick with each other. So the white tower may just snap midway through the print and well in addition to that flex material and poa material on a 75 degrees celsius hotbed is too flexible too soft to be able to be used at the first layer of uh, the of the white tower and i think you can uh, see it this in the background footage there where the white tower actually uh, actually already failed but it is only barely holding on to the dear life by the tension of the print on the bottom to deal with this what you can do is that you can use this option here in the slicer to dictate uh, which extruder to use for the brim and, and the outer shell of the wipe tower. The next problem to deal with is specifically for ABS and that is material warpage. And well obviously uh, warping on your printed part is not good. But in addition to that, I would like to point out that the geometry of the wipe tower is extremely susceptible to failure due to warping. And the best way to mitigate that is to slow down that specific extruder. To do that, head to the speed tab of your slicer and set this acceleration for the wipe tower 
to something that is a bit conservative and here you see I had I set it as uh, 300 millimeter per second square and remember this thing uh, will be collecting all the blob and the bad material that is coming out of the tip of the nozzles uh, after each tool change and unlike every other object in your print if the white tower failed the entire print job will be in jeopardy to further reduce the warping of your ABS part that is printed in a colder than ideal chamber, go to the filament uh, settings and reduce the max volume metric speed uh, of that ABS material. All right, it's quite that's quite a lengthy video. So uh, pat yourself in the back and you make it all the way to the end. If you like the video, remember to like and subscribe. If you appreciate what I'm doing here, then please consider buying me a coffee with the links below. And with that, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.